Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to Mr. Van Lathan. Hi. How y'all doing? Y'all good? You know, uh, if you don't know Van, um, part of doing an AI conversation is really to map your moments, map your data points. And so as I was thinking about rolling out and how much I hate the cultural ignorance that exists in black America, I was trying to figure out who is my griot and who was approaching conversation. So, you know, Van, I don't listen to your podcast. Damn. And uh, we starting off on the wrong and, foot. And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Come on, bro. You we didn't see each other. But I hover on his podcast. Now, what hovering means is Van is in my house on my television in a room that I'm in. I didn't turn him on. And I hope many of you have people in your lives who you hover and get information from. I promise you, if you don't, you're going to be the biggest unsmart person that I've ever met. <laughs> Somebody has to be able to prescribe to you other things that you don't know about so you don't know everything because you don't. So I'm hovering and, and, you know, I'm listening to Van Chronicle, Call Cap. Then I'm really proud of you only because you're an independent black man with his own show. Shout out what it is. Um, and you're vulnerable, at least on the podcast, you appear vulnerable to me, which I enjoy. Um, and so when I wanted to think about how I ended the moment, and this is my history, because it's rolling out, it's my money, it's the sponsors paying, and how I want to disseminate, I just want to say thanks for how you disseminate mm. and at least make us approach ourselves and at least rethink about how we're approaching ourselves as a black griot. Mm. So thank you very much, brother. I received that, brother. I appreciate that, my man. I appreciate that. Yeah. So uh, that was my long speech, you guys, to say, listen to Van when you uh, are out there. A higher frequency is great. I, uh, obviously, I think you are definitely in my top two. I'm not going to tell you who's number one, but uh, you are in my house. I don't say turn you off and really appreciate it. Um, Van, how is it moving in AI and how are you approaching AI just in your life? Um, interesting. First of all, thank you for being, thank you for having me here and uh, thank you for the kind words. I think at first I was trepidatious about it just because um, of, you know, my childhood. And I think when you hear the words artificial intelligence or AI, you think about giving up agency. You're thinking about ceding your agency as a human being to something that is going to make decisions for you. And, you know, I think Terminator 2, Judgment Day, The Matrix, the whole nine, I remember in the Terminator 2, all of Los Angeles blew up. And I was like, Daddy, we got to go to church, the whole thing. But when I felt that little twinge of fear, which change in technology always um, inspires that um, to some degree, I wanted to learn a little bit more about it. And when you learn more about it, you get to see how you can maximize uh, the capability of whatever you're doing by integrating it. And then you get a sense of um, what the limits of it should be. Like the amount of comfortability that, you, uh, that you'd that you have with it being in your life. So being where I'm at right now in Los Angeles, I see a lot of people who are very scared of what it means for their jobs and their, and, and, and their long-term employment. But I also see a lot of people who are incredibly inspired by their ability to scale productions, to scale businesses, to get things off the ground using less startup capital because of what AI can do. You know, you're a griot. I'm giving you all these uh, 
titles in, in particular because the conversation of Black America, are we having the proper conversations about technology, uh, commerce, um, or do you think that we get caught in that moment where we are watching a comedian and they're taking three hours of our time mm. and we're not taking those same three hours on our health and in how AI or anything else can move us forward? Great question. I think the challenge sometimes and, you know, being black is just the most amazing gift that you can be given, in my opinion. I just I, I love it so much, man. I, I love the way it feels. Um, you know, I think about my mother, my grandmother. I think about everything, man. It's just I love being a black man from South Louisiana. Um, but along with that comes some American cultural priority. And it's a safari for us, very dangerous jungle. And we've been looking for trip wires and avoiding animals and uh, getting out of the way of obstacles for a long time. And that becomes instinct after a while. And when you're in that mode of thinking instinctually, how do I survive? How do I do this? Who's going to help me? Who's going to, uh, who's going to, turn their back on me. I mean, we think about people and we go, oh, that person's an agent, that person's an agent, that person's an agent. You see somebody on TV, I don't quite trust them, all of that. We think that way because we're waiting for the next shoe to drop at all times because we have to be. That sometimes stops you from being forward thinking. And that's not to say that black Americans aren't forward thinking. We're some, we've developed some of the most incredible strategies to make it in America than anybody else. Um, but we have to prioritize thinking outside of the survival matrix, outside of what's going to kill us and what's going to grow us. And what I think is we're just getting to the point now, or at least in my life, where we're having conversations about um, not how we survive, but how we build and how we thrive and how we move on. Before I even go there, I'd say this. It's not that we haven't done this before. Every single thing that America has told black people that they need to do to be successful, we've done it. Land ownership, banks, schools, hospitals, all of that. The interesting thing about it is every time we do it, America just says no. Take it, burn it down, destroy it, rip it apart, then make you build it again. Uh, the question I think is we're asking ourselves now is how do we build something that's indestructible? And what are the ingredients to that? Because other cultures certainly seem to be pretty tough on you say anything about them, you gotta do an apology tour for six, seven, eight, nine months. But, and so, so for, for us, we're looking about, looking at how you do that and we're attempting to do it now. And I think all the technology and all the forward thinking that you're talking about is gonna be part of the prescription. You know, we're sitting in Morehouse College and, and young brothers might be tuning in. You're at Spelman. Um, you're working with a dear friend of mine, Otavio, uh, um, who I uh, admire, respect as a CEO, corporate board member. What do you suggest to those young CEOs now that you see in Van? Did they understand about the people who are across from the table when you're across from a giant like you've been on tmc mm -hmm. and you know how they operate what should we be demanding of corporate america that we might not be demanding now given your independence you've got your own show what should we be demanding that you think we may not see so this is actually one of the most challenging questions that i get and the reason why is because I'm about to say something, and I understand that it's hard. Uh, so for me, I always was able to get whatever was coming to me by being exactly who I am. And I would say this all the time. My brother's a lawyer, and he'd be like, bruh, you know, I work at Citigroup. I can't do that. Like, I, I cannot, I, like, I can't just go in there and, you know, and ask the partners what's their favorite episode of Martin. 
Like, you know, you know what I mean? I got to do it a different way. It's a different game. And I understand that. But I think there is a story that we are sometimes afraid to tell because we're afraid of our story offending someone. And the only power that you have in this country is your story. It's your history. It's what you've overcome. It's what you want to be. It's where you're going. And the minute you whisper it, they don't hear it. So what I would say is the boldest part of you is the part of you that can't be denied. Every single person in this room is a one-on-one. If you consider that fact, that means that in the future of the galaxy and in the past, there'll never be another you. You're inherently the rarest thing that's ever walked the earth. There's no more of you never want to use. So anytime you turn yourself down, I think it's an affront to God. So when you're sitting in front of someone, your outlook, your perspective, who you are, the way you look at things, they have to understand that they can't get that from anybody else. It has to be respected. It has to be honored. With me at TMZ, honestly, I got what I got there by telling them that they didn't know what they was talking about when it came to my culture. That's how it was prior to the Kanye thing. Like prior to anything that happened that I'm an expert on this. You don't know. You're not going to let me come in your house and tell you the way things go. So don't tell me how the things go in mine. And there's so many examples of that. Um, and it's a difficult place to work. You can't really be rebellious when you're in there working for them because it's not a good organization. You can only be the spoo who sat by the door. But there's so many examples of that that I go back and I look at it and I think maybe I could have been more discerning at times, but I'm glad that I wasn't. Even the fact that I got fired from there at the time that I did was a blessing. So uh, for me, I think the boldness of who we are in terms of being in corporate settings, less assimilation. I think we tried assimilation, I don't think it works. I think the only thing that'll work is strength and solidarity. Great segue, strength and solidarity. When you imagine that you have five black billionaires, you're sitting at Morehouse College, you see Clark across the way, Spellman across the way. Do you believe now in your bold thinking that black billionaires and black individuals of major wealth should really be giving more of their wealth to future black people? I don't care about black billionaires. I wish everybody cared less, honestly. Say it a little louder. I said, I, I don't care about black billionaires. I wish everybody cared a little bit less. I don't want to offend anyone, but what I care about, honestly, is not how much philanthropy you do. I care about system building. I care about recreatable success, structures, homes, neighborhoods, churches, schools, grocery stores. In North Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I'm from, there is one grocery store. I'm talking about from the point that LSU in downtown starts all the way to the country. It's one grocery store. It's a food desert, one of the most expansive and vast food deserts in, in America. A billionaire can't fix that. And if they could have, they should have done it already. What I care about is the life of the C-plus black person in America, the person that needs a good job, a good wage, and a good house. And if you can tell me how a black billionaire is going to facilitate that for those people, generation after generation after generation, then I would care about that. But a lot of times these people that we're talking about, and I don't want to seem, I don't want to be negative, the amount of compromises that have had to be made to get to that point don't necessarily lend themselves to be the most active in community. I think if there were more thousandaires and less billionaires, the America would probably be a better place. That's not saying don't go out and make a billion dollars. 
I'm not saying that. Make as much money as you can and then invite me on the boat because I'm going to come with you. But what I'm saying is that sometimes we talk about success in ways and I don't think we we do the we don't run through these these concepts with a fine tooth comb. Okay, we we have more black billionaires than we've ever had. That's great. Income inequality is as high as it's ever been. So that means that they're richer than they've ever been. True, cool. But the amount of money in the pot for everybody else is not as abundant. So would you trade two or three more Michael Jordans for a couple of families who can't make ends meet? It's just unsustainable. It's not going to work. And so we have to look at not just income inequality in America. We have to look at income inequality within our own community and the difference between the haves and the have nots and worshiping the American capitalist system that is built off of the free labor that we established is probably not the best way to go unless we are going to inject culture into that. And culture means the solidarity of black people building that wealth together. That's a conversation I'm here for, but I'm not much of a, uh, of a, um, of a worshiper of wealth, despite how much this chain cost me. Well, you know, the good thing my wife told me I was going to push back on you. <laughs> uh, I, I hear you, but I, I don't believe it. Um, and for, several reasons obviously um and i'm glad you're here um glad you have it but i suffer every tax that every black man does to another black man i get a tax when will smith smacked my brother i got a tax i had a curse I got an assumption. And so I think there, there are taxes for even mega black people because they point to their success. And I pay the tax. Why can't you be like that person? So I, I understand what you're saying, but I do want us to think about becoming tax collectors. I think we should be able to ask our people who are watching those who have less and have some type of cultural tax. Hmm. So I'm, I'm not obliged to give you a pass because you're robbing from which you hail or point to. So that's more of your brother's concept. So I'm not, I'm not I don't wanna let you pass. I believe it is, it's, a, it's a, a love tie to acknowledge. If you say you hip hop, then pay the hip hop. If you, if you love it. So, you know, we can... I agree. Let me say one thing to that. And I agree. And I, I'm, I'm, I don't disagree that everyone should do that. Like, you should care about black people. We're not doing well enough. <laughs> Ain't nobody doing well enough for us to get someplace and just not care about black people. I'm sorry. I'm going to look at you away. This is what I'm saying. There's a difference to me between... I'll give you an example. When you say that you want someone to feel safe, what you're really saying is that you want them to feel powerful because power is the only way that someone can be completely safe. Like if two guys are about to fight right here, one guy is huge and he's training MMA and the other guy is a little dude or whatever. If this guy decides to stall him out, he might feel safe but he's not safe, he's protected. Two different things. If these people are equals, and he, not even if they're equals, if he just knows, the bigger guy, that the smaller guy can hurt him, that might be enough for safety, right? When I look at people who have great deals of wealth, it's difficult for me to be in a posture where I want them, I want them compelled to do something. What I want them to do is build the structures and put them in place so that people have the opportunity to hold them accountable so that the people are powerful and so we don't have to worry about whether or not somebody cares enough about us to do what they should be doing 
the consequence should be inherent in the systems that are built. If you care enough, uh, if you are got $5 billion, the question is, how much do you care about the people that work for you? How much money are they making? How much does, do people that work for you have the opportunity to be you? Or are you annoying yourself a king that's going to rule for a couple of generations and make sure that everybody is up under you? So I think that's just the way that I'm looking at it. I'm not saying that I, I disagree with you. All of these people that have these vast sums of wealth they owe us politically, they owe us socially, they owe us because a lot of times they leverage their culture and their blackness in order to get to these places. And that tax that you're talking about is very real. Yeah. And, and I'm really just uh, talking to the Grio, so I'm really not, not uh, worried about that. I, I'm really concerned, even as it relates to AI, will we come together as you think collectively and think about the bias. And I'll give you an idea of bias. You see the images that I've created, all these are images created. But I put in black female and black male. And after about 20 times, it automatically gives me a white female or white male. If everybody in this room isn't creating more images in AI and you're sitting back on the sidelines, it's not going to have any images to learn from. I just want you to understand that. When I, uh, and, I and I have an advantage because I, I love and respect who you are as a young brother, um, but I want us to think about the fact that more of us need to support his podcast. More of us need to create content. How do you imagine podcasting in the future will impact, AI will impact podcasting? Um, well, AI can impact anything. You could, I mean, AI could listen to this conversation right now and uh, and then reproduce a different version of the conversation where we're saying all different things. Like, you know, there is a, a side of AI that, um, that is uh, concerning in its capability. I posted something on my, um, on my Instagram about a guy and it looked totally real. It was not real. It was not him. He had to take five seconds of himself and of his voice and then recreate it using an AI. But all of those things are, are the sky's falling types of ways to look at it. I don't think that podcasting has very much of a future. You know, there are people that came up to me and said, yo, I think I'm looking for the next thing. Because when I say everybody has a podcast, everybody has a podcast every single person has a podcast and so i think it's a very powerful medium but i think like anything else it just becomes people talking the question is and i haven't answered this question yet is is there a way to combine the technology of podcasting with the technology of ai in some way that's compelling the people uh and these are questions that we'd have to ask that are cultural questions as well like if I don't know if I wanted to talk to Sammy Davis Jr. on the podcast, you know, <laughs> or we talked a little bit about that, but is that something we should even be doing? Because just cause you can, doesn't mean that you should. So, you know, moving forward, um, I think artificial intelligence is going to be a staple of the future of human beings. The question is how do we maximize it while still controlling it? As far as podcasting is concerned, it's just a lot of noise. Every day I hear people talking about splitting the rent and who going to pay for the first date. And man, should you pay for her nails? And I'm like, y'all, <laughs> it's got to be something else, bro. Every single, you know. Yeah, um, I'm glad you said that. I, I, so I'm, I'm flying 35,000 feet in the air. And, uh, you know, most people know me. I, I will save a dollar. <laughs> so, you know, it was $800 to fly from my mother's birthday in Tucson, because I'm from Tucson. And I talked to my cousin, Brian, when we were there. And, and it was 800 to fly, two stops. 
it was 334 to go through LA to go to Detroit. And it was an 18 hour ride. Save four hundred dollars. I know you wouldn't have done that, but um I sit on a plane with a light physicist and he starts to describe his PhD to me. And I said, well, that's great. I said, what are you getting ready to do? What do you think he said, man? Podcast? Close. He said he was moving to AI. Ah. He said he was moving to AI, man. So I'm 35, you know, and now I got God in the room with me. Cause so it's just him. I'm up late. I didn't, I didn't want to be there, man. I promise you I didn't, but I didn't want to give nobody $400 just for flying me on a piece of steel. So I'm keeping my bread. Cause I know I'm going to spend 400 somewhere, uh, including talent, which I appreciate. One thing I do want to thank you. Uh, cause now, nah, but he negotiated as a straight brother. And he gave me no problem. He said, it's the price. I know you could afford it. And it was there. But I'm sitting next to a guy with a PhD in light. And he says he's leaving his field to study AI. Does everybody in the room know what that means? He, he, he has decided whatever he gave his time to, he's going to AI. So then he's on the plane van and I sit next to him, you know, brothers, we lean in cause he ain't giving up the information and all on his thing van is open files of research from other research institutes about material. Are we going to, are, are black people or how would you encourage black people to lean in to begin to study about how we can reimagine our communities with AI. Because when, when you say that, I've, let's see, how can we use it that way? Can, can everybody in the room imagine that grocery store? Can we begin to at least build it for the, the planners in our minds? Can you see that? I can. I mean, if I was sitting next to that guy, I guess what I would ask them is, and this is the gauge since he's moving into AI, I guess my question for him is how far away, because we're 35,000 feet, we're cruising, how far away are we right now from you being comfortable with there being no pilot in the seat up there? Yeah, given him, he probably is real comfortable. Right, I'm just saying, like how, like how far away are, would you be right now? Because when we think about it, we're thinking about this. Even if I were to envision a grocery store that I could build, and and put in North Baton Rouge. Um, what you're thinking about is automation, you're, but not just automation. You're thinking about a, a, a place that's able to do what a community grocery store would have to do, which is understand the needs nutritionally of the, uh, of the people there, be able to work with smaller brands that you're probably gonna carry in that place. Um, because if you're having a grocery store that's serving one specific community, like my mom and them make food. They're not going to be able to sell the stuff that they make to Walmart, but Ellis Corner Groceries, other places like that, they have those relationships where they can go in there and do that. So from a community standpoint, we would have to make the AI brain think the way we would want to think about our communities, which asks us a question, which is, how do we want to think about our communities? And so I think the first thing is to understand it, that those computer modalities and the things that we're talking about are going to mimic uh, what they see in society. And I think what you just said earlier is a huge part of that. You have to be participatory, right? You have to have skin in the game. You, you, if you want to be heard, you have to be in the conversation. So we're going to have to learn more about AI. We're going to have to learn more about ourselves. And then we're going to have to learn what it offers to us and what it can't do. But it's going to have to be something that's done in a very robust way at places like here at Morehouse, schools, STEM centers around the country. And we're going to have to kind of stop talking about it like it's some harbinger of doom and really invest into it before we miss the wave. 
Yeah, thank you for that. So Homeboy starts talking about a piece of paper at 35,000 um, square feet, y'all. And he says, every piece of matter that you ever thought was something will become something else with AI. Properties for all materials and laws that how light moves energy is going to change with AI. And he opens up the paper and, you know, it ain't going to show me but so much. But he's like, this piece of paper knows that it's a piece of paper, but with a little bit of light, it can become something else. It can start being fire. Or we can begin to know with AI how to communicate light through this piece of paper to turn it into steel and energy. I want everybody to leave here on a higher frequency. I want everybody who's here to start flying at 35,000 square feet. Hi. If you're not imagining that, and somebody has a podcast called Higher Frequency, it's a higher frequency out here right now, y'all. Do not leave here with not knowing that his podcast name and the way you need to think it, AI, is not as a word processor or any capability that you know of today. The disruptors of societies changed how you ride or ride to any place if you ain't got a car now. Everybody in here got a driver. If you want a limousine to pick you up right now, a guy said he can make that happen. 20 years ago, somebody said, that's a lie. It's reserved for these people. Nobody thought they could rent their car. Now everybody can rent their car. I just want us, Van, how do we embrace that type of higher frequency thinking, bruh, to open our minds to thinking that paper is maybe something else if I could stay on and ask the computer enough questions that it might begin to learn something that I'm saying that will heal my community. Yeah. Um, I mean, that just comes from, from conversation. It really does. Conversations about AI, conversations about, you said something earlier and it's cool to get into a lot of the back and forth that we have on social media is fun. I do it too, man. Risa, Tisa, the whole nine, I watched it, you know, but it is, it's like, we also have to push ourselves to endeavor into science, endeavor into things. America does a good job of making us think that some of these things aren't for us. Um, it was funny during the whole pandemic, uh, I was really interested in like the vaccination debate, just talking about vaccination. So I wanted to learn everything I could uh, about the vaccine. I couldn't, you know, I had time to do nothing else. So it was like nothing else to do. And I learned something that was very interesting that I never knew, which is that we essentially invented vaccination. Uh, Edward Jenner, the guy who invented the smallpox vaccine had been very elated and variolation was they would take a little bit of pus from a smallpox blister and they would give it to you when you were young and you would develop a, um, an immunity to that. That was invented in Central and West Africa um, and India as well. They would smoke it. It's called insufflation. And so because he realized that these people that lived on the continent that had uh, this symbiotic relationship with um, with nature had figured out a way to naturally protect themselves from disease. It had been done to him and he was like, okay, well, if they've done that, then what do I do? And he went and he took the little piece of the cowpox vaccine. Vodka means cow. That's where the word vaccine comes from. And he synthesized it. A leads to B. And then by the time 1980 comes, the next 150, 200 years, the smallpox vaccine is eradicated. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how do I know that that part of science comes from my lineage? How do I not know that? I'm 41 years old. Like At that point, I'm like, how do I not know that? And that's because 
those conversations aren't had with us. We're not given any agency. We're not taught about the contributions to not just the natural world, but to the scientific world that we have endeavored to give. And we're on the precipice of something right now with AI and with a whole bunch of other things to where we can make our presence felt in innovation and in cultural innovation but it comes through wanting to have those conversations, being serious enough to have those conversations and having them in places like this. Uh, is it back? No, this is different. This is dead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you take this. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just okay. kidding. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thing I'm, I'm sharing and I appreciate that is, is it's on all of us to continue what you just did. Like, literally, you have to reimagine black history. Like, with AI. You've got to reimagine everything. I was in Tulsa. Has anybody in here been to Tulsa? It is the most painful place for me to be. I mean, you're in Tulsa. You know that all black America knows that they massacred the people, and nobody black owns any of that land, even now. And they know exactly who bought the property after the black person owned it. You go to Greenwood and there's a community center with all the black faces and voices. The brother that owned the airline is in there. How do we get those messages so that we can recreate that with AI, do you suggest? Hmm. Using AI to kind of tell that story? That's interesting. I hadn't really considered that. I mean, the one thing that you can do with AI, one of the things that I know that you can do is it, it the computer theoretically would be free of some of the biases in telling American history that other people might have. It spits out data. So for example, could AI imagine what black wealth in Oklahoma would be had the Greenwood massacre never happened, right? Could, black, could AI imagine what black wealth in Rosewood or North Carolina or different places like that, or even in my home of, of a, of Baton Rouge, which was, you know, we had urban renewal and all types of gentrification, white flight, all of that stuff in South Baton Rouge. Could it imagine all of that, right? And if it imagines what we would have had, what we could have had, and Dr. Sandy Darity wrote a good book called uh, From Here to Equality, where he actually puts a number on um, everything that was taken. If you can imagine those communities, what they would look like, or what they might have, where they would go, then we could, we could have a sense maybe of what was taken. And the justice could also be restorative in a very direct way. The story is told and obviously, you know, you talk about the real victims and the, uh, the legacy of the Tulsa race massacre and, and what happened, but to take it further, to be more immersed into it, um, to use it to really uh, to the nth degree, get people intimately acquainted with the legacy of what was taken. I mean, home ownership by black Americans plummeted by about 10 or 15% Oklahoma worldwide after uh, Oklahoma statewide after that. The legacy of Greenwood is it's devastating, right? Um, how much, and that's just based on human computing, like, can the computer help us talk about this? Can it help us contextualize our experience? Can it help us think about what we're missing out on by not establishing communities like that now? Can you use AI to ask, answer cultural questions like, how, what's the most effective way to have unity in group operations? What's the most effective place for black people to concentrate land ownership or political power? Um, Environmentally, there's a huge thing in the southern part of America right now in terms of urban farming. How do you use artificial intelligence to help you 
in urban farming and farming in places where uh, there's not a whole ton of land to where the efficiency of the farming has to be uh, to the nth degree. Like how can you get more and more and more? And these are cultural questions that technology can help answer if you're, answering, if you're asking the technology the right questions. So I was flying about 35,000 square feet and uh, I do a basketball move into my seat. And then I sit next to a little guy and he's from Guatemala. He's flown to Tucson because he sells cuts. So I never knew what a cut was. My grandma had a garden. They were from Baton Rouge. Louisiana. Um, he sells a million, no, 112 million cuts. And cuts are plants that they grow in Guatemala and then they start moving the plants. And he talked about how AI was going to make it so he didn't have to grow cuts and move the pots anymore. He said, and he showed me a picture, and it was a warehouse. It was bigger than like 10 football fields. And every pot, as a plant grows, the cuts that he sells, it literally has to move because it's, it's growing. It's a plant. And he talked about the future of how AI was going to allow gardening to happen with the, all the robots. Because in America, those pots are moved by humans. In Guatemala, they're moved by men and women, 70% women. So I, I, I want us to make sure when we think of even the application of things you're receiving, to imagine that that is actually happening. And so I, 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 even with everything that you're saying, Van, I want us to even join that. Because if, if you can't imagine Frederick Douglass speaking now, you should. If you can't, if you say you want to be a female entrepreneur, everything that Madam C.J. Walker wrote or put down now is getting ready to be in a hologram. She will be able to coach you. The computer is going to teach you and learn from everything she said and begin to reimagine how she would approach or coach somebody. Those are the things we have to be thinking collectively as we reimagine our community. And that's more the challenge. And, that, and that's kind of what I'm, I'm saying. I, I think the, it's the dimension. Like if you don't imagine yourself owning robots, then you're gonna be afraid. Of but if everybody in here can imagine owning 50 robots, you feel a whole lot different. VAs are going to go away. Virtual assistants that everybody uses out of the Philippines, they're going to go away. Because AI is going to be just as efficient. Costs 100 times less. So Van, what level of courage and, and, and should we leave here today taking with us to really say, you know, the community needs us. What should we do? I'm thinking about the 50 robots real quick. Hold on. Damn, I don't want them to have a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and look, you know, the first thing that you think when you say 50 robots, is, you know, I think, I think, you know, they got the nice robots. You got C-3PO, R2-D2s, a couple of nice ones. And then I've seen a couple of mean ones too, and I'm trying to figure out. You know, I want them to be. I can't kill you. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, no, look. It, 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 the part of this is just going to be a demystifying of some of this stuff. Um, sometimes, you know, having conversations like this, they're a little hard because we're uninitiated. Like, where do you get information like this that you trust, right? Like, where do you get it that you trust? Or like, you know, who tells you that it's okay? When we were talking about AI, I went into it very uh, whatever. And then Neela Patel from 
uh, from Verge, Verge came on and he was laughing about it. And he was just talking about all the things that you could do. And I felt small. I felt like, oh my God, I'm country. I am, a, I am country. My daddy from Maringwin, Louisiana, population 2100, I'm country. I'm a coon skinner, a deer hunter, a fisherman. I'm all of that. Like, so there's a couple of these things, you know, I don't walk under ladders. I see a black cat. I'll drive around the block. I'm just, you, you know what I mean? I'm, I got that with me. Um, and so I think a part of what you're saying, the boldness of what it is that you're saying lies in the fact that most of these technologies are here to enhance our lives. And we'd have conversations about productivity, about scaling businesses, about, and it's honestly with the, the lack of investment into resource and infrastructure that we are, are subject to as black people, some of these things are just dying for, for us to optimize them, to be able to get to where we're going a lot sooner. So I think, number one, there needs to be, in my opinion, um, black futurism is something that's growing. Uh, it's growing exponentially. Even before the AI boom, black futurism, black tech, black STEM programs, just us being uh, a part of that conversation is growing at a rapid rate. But I guess the long, the short way of me answering your question is that we need voices we can trust I mean, we're cultural, communal people, and we just need people to be like, it's going to be all right. So the question is, who's going to be the Neil deGrasse Tyson um, of, of AI? I'm serious. Like, it, 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 maybe it might, we might be better off if we didn't need those people, but we need people who can speak that are way more educated than I am about this stuff. Um, and we need people that are curious like you to ask the people on you next to the plane, because I don't do that. I put the mask on, boom, out. Uh, so we need all of that stuff. And I think it's coming. I think conversations like this help it out. It helps you to be a little bit more bold, or be a little bit more curious. Um, and then it just snowballs, you know? Thanks for that. Uh, the other thing I, I, I want us to think about um, is generative. And uh, I'm not sure that I want to make sure you're thinking generative when you leave here. Um, Van's been kind enough to talk with his brother for an hour. But uh, 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 I want you to think about generative. Um, one of the worst experiences I have is I, when I bought a house. It was really huge. Need a lot of work. And I needed an architect. Today... As long as I can imagine the square footage, I don't even have to have it perfect. AI will tell me everything about that room. I don't need an art detect for the same rationale. If you're thinking about tile, choices of your business, you can automate all of that with AI today, generative. Think about what you're going to generate with AI in your life. Think about the perspectives of how you're going to approach AI. Because the only limit right now as it relates to generative AI is your imagination. Owen, is it Owen? Yeah. So, Owen, I don't want you to leave here thinking about AI taking your idea. What I want you to think about is how do you prompt AI to have an idea? That's when you're winning. If you're not making the computer have an idea, you're not going to come away with anything. It can't give you anything that you don't imagine for and with it. And that's houses, mansions. I do think we're going to figure out new urban renewal ideas to remove tobacco swamps. 
but we're going to have to generate those ideas for AI to have it as a solution and to create new systems that we demand from AI as it relates to our hardship, our distance from healthcare, our distance from learning, our alarms that we allow people who have been in the penal system to understand that we will create alarm systems so that you will not be repeat offenders. When you think of social ills, think of how many applications you would like to give to your community through AI and for AI to generate benefits for your community as it comes up with an idea, Owen. Then we'll start to heal this community. Ben, I want to thank you for taking and hanging out with me. It's good to see you. Um, any questions for Van for you guys? I want to say we didn't give you guys. Go ahead, Owen. Um, so obviously you guys saw the news about Tyler and what he just said about, um, I know maybe you didn't see it. Uh, Tyler Perry was contemplating an 18, $800 million add on to his studio. And when he saw open AI's, um, text to video model, Sora, he decided he wasn't going to do it cause he didn't need to. That is right now freaking everybody out in LA. I just to be honest with you, it's causing a panic. Um, and it, it, it's it's causing a panic because well, what does that mean? I mean, $800 million, somebody's going to get hired. They're going to be jobs created. This is the way I look at that. For me, storytelling and producing stuff is a very human thing. It's incredibly human done by human people, by emoting to one another about finding it, you can enhance what you do with AI on the back end after everyone's collaborated to tell the story that you want to tell. That's how I look at it. Now, I'm telling you right now, there are going to be people in the next year, year and a half, two years that are going to produce full features, not shorts, full features of completely photorealistic scenarios using text to video models and using artificial intelligence. And it's going to look perfect, as perfect as it can look to your eyes. And it's going to be insanely cheap. Um, I'm not going to be doing that because I believe, because I'm just, I'm old school like that. But what I will do is when we're up against it budget wise and we need reshoots we need to go to places we're already hitting our line limit on different things i think that that technology is going to be utilized especially for someone who makes smaller movies like myself to be able to get to where i'm trying to go um under budget uh that's me but i'm telling you right now there's going to be somebody that's gonna be 10, 15 films in with no actors, and it's coming very soon. I'm completely uncomfortable with it. I'm, I, I, I'm not a fan of that. And the only reason why I'm not a fan of that is because, um, like I told y'all before, man, like, you know, I like to look at blades of grass and watch the ants crawl on them in Louisiana. I like to smell the bayou. I like, you know what I mean? I, that's not for me. But I'm I'm one of the people that's flying the plane while since we use the flying the plane analogy, I'm learning how to fly the plane while we're still in the sky. So I've already started a filmmaking career, production career while that's happening. The generation behind me and the one behind them are just not going to care. They're, they're not going to care. They're going to end up making seven, eight, nine movies a year 
debuting multiple movies, debuting movie trilogies in a whole weekend. It's going to be different. It's not an if, it's a win. And the only thing that can stop it is the collective power of unions, the, the WGA, the SGA, and other places. For me, that's not those aren't the type of stories that I want to tell and necessarily that I want to watch. But I can't be obtuse um, and thinking that it's not going that way um, because it is. So, Owen, I would try not to be distracted. Sometimes any big news is no news. Don't own other people's problems. We ain't hearing enough of our stories, seen enough of our sitcoms to really act like we got skin in that game. We've got to leverage this technology, Owen to make as many movies as you can to get as many black dollars and other dollars into your pocket as possible. You can't be feeling sorry for a studio that, and I'm not just saying you, that historically don't even think about you. Like, like I don't want us to find problems that aren't ours. And I don't want people to give us news that ain't our news. You know, and that's not talking about them, but we get so caught off on news that ain't news for us. It ain't solving our problem. I got a problem that there ain't 20 Denzels. I got a problem that we don't get five, $500 million movies, but other folk can spend $500 million and, and blow a movie. Like, just give me 20% of what you blow. These were all your losers. Just give black people 20% of all of what you lost, that you know you lost. I mean, I, I think we economically, we have to be in a place where truth reigns supreme. So when people put out news like that, I'm like, how are you losing? The question is, how can I win when you lose it? That's, that's, that's the question. You know, you, you, we use this um, um, American philosophy and you got China and India thinking about how to be in the moon. I want everybody to leave here thinking about how to be in the moon, how to get to the moon. They're not going up in the moon just to figure it out. They're thinking, well, you know, like the guy with the light. He happened to have conversation about the moon. He says, well, in space, the theory of life is different. His thinking is not on this current situation. His thinking is how do I win and bring something to market that I can take public tomorrow that will bring my, camp, my family billions? He ain't worried about somebody else's problem. He's trying to come with a solution for his. And I think as we take news and repeat it, how does it really impact you? Is it, is it really an impact? Or are we going to take this technology and say, you know what? They wouldn't make me a movie and get me a, you know, when I saw SAR, it had a uh, huge, not an elephant, what was the, the mammal that, that had this hairy and it's non-existent? Willie Mammoth. So now, Hollywood ain't going, if, you, if you're a brother and you want an animated script, Hollywood don't just say, okay, Brian, here you go. Let's do it tomorrow. They're going to probably tell you, even if you give you a green light, tell you what studio you got to go make it with. This is disrupting the entire paradigm of how people look at creativity. That's where you want to be. You don't want to be in an old system that didn't really even let you in the game or let two people in the game. Why are we talking about a place you can't go? We want to be in spaces that don't want us. You can be at home making your own movie with your own crew. And then the distribution models are going to change. 
again, and you might own one. That might be the consideration. More distribution owners that look like us. So the trillion we got can stay inside this room. But if we keep talking about their problem, then I'm confused. So I hear you. This is what I would say. When you think about, when I think about the mechanism of making a film, uh, I think about not just me. So we made Two Distant Strangers, the first movie we made. We made a half a million dollars, uh, 38 minutes long, Academy Award winning um, movie, right? We make it so that it's me, Trayvon, it's Nick. We bring in Puff, Kevin Durant, uh, Michael Finley. Um, we have the directors, writers, we have all of these people, black, black, right? The director, Trayvon and Martin co-directed, so Martin Desmond Rowe was white, but everybody that's making the film go and everybody that's doing that, those are all jobs. And because of the fact that we pay for it ourselves and I was able to raise the rest of the money, all of those people are working. So I think what you're saying is absolutely true because and on one hand, because the distribution models and the idea of a film set and a film crew and all of those things will change. But I think the people who have some fear about where their jobs right now are going to go, I don't think those fears are unwarranted because if you're a black set dresser, if you're a black location scout, um, if you're a black screenwriter, if you're a black background extra, like if you make money doing backgrounds, you can animate those people. That's gonna change. So I think what people are, there's a little bit of sphincter tightening right now about like where things are gonna go. I don't think it's unwarranted. I think we have to be bold and understand uh, how to use the technology. But I think also for me, when I think of a film set or when I think of making a movie, or even when I think of the, the Midnight Boys, you know, it's four of us. Podcasts start off as me, but it's four of us. I think of an ecosystem and what everybody can do. And we're still learning those lessons. And there are people that are concerned about what jobs the computer will be. And this is everywhere, by the way. This is just in Hollywood. This is not just here in Atlanta. This is, am I gonna be able to get a job doing this because the computer can do it better? Am I gonna be able to job doing that because the computer can do it better? These are all questions that we have to ask and questions that we have to answer. Um, they're not easy questions, but I think it's fair to at least contemplate them is what I would say to, to you and you know, whatever. But that doesn't mean that I'm not, I might not one day be like, you know what? I just wanna make a movie. I wanna make Boys in the Hood, but on Jupiter. Same movie, except this time, Ricky zigzags like he should have, and he survives, you know what I mean? So I wanna make the same movie. Y'all know he should have ran in a zigzag pat pattern. But uh, all of that stuff, I wanna be able to stretch my imagination, but when I think about making movies, I really think about being with the community of people and thinking about what kind of dope shit we could do. And I'm there. Um, I just don't want us to think of industries that have not had a welcome mat and for years ignored our creativity. And I want more of us to take control of our own creativity. You know, I think we're going to have to revisit a lot of things. You know, the publishing of black recording artists whose songs people never wrote. I mean, that's gonna come up. It's gonna, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Um, and I'm not ag against making, you know, vinyl records, if that's what you wanna make, or vinyl films, you know, if that's what you wanna make. But I wanna say to the entrepreneurs out there, if you out there, worrying about what Hollywood's worrying about. You know, just listen to what Van was saying. Me and Kevin Durant, Kevin don't have a money problem. 
I ain't gonna count your money on stage, man. But I hope you ain't got a money problem. But if you're a young entrepreneur, you better embrace this technology and run for it and think about going public. I don't want our community to leave here, Van, thinking that Munson said, oh, they don't want Tyler to grow his studio. That's not true. What I am saying is you've got bigger problems to worry about than Tyler. He has a million people he can hire to worry about his problem. He has the money for that. You've got to figure out where is your win? Where can you win in this eco-creative system? And if you embrace this technology, the possibility is much closer. I think the way that we make them won't change overnight because I don't think everybody can even use SAR today. But, but the adaptability that I want us to leave here as we close out, um, you know, adapt, 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 and pivot, pivot, pivot. Because you need to really make sure that you're adapting this technology. It's so beautiful to go on at YouTube University and see, I can ask Google, Art architecture generational software. And it'll give me 20. And then there are about 50 people that believe their authorities in the subject. And they'll review all the most recent ways. And so now you can say, I'm in a 10 by 10 apartment. Can you redesign this and put these pictures on the wall? And what should I have? It'll generate that. But if you say put a deck on my back and give me 10 or 20 different iterations, it'll do that too. And you won't have to call anybody but the computer, your assistant. So I want us to think of generative AI as a tool for you to make money. That's my main thing. I don't want you to think of generative AI as how to fix your resume. You know, you should be thinking about how it frees you up to be free as an entrepreneur and solve social problems so we can reimagine ourselves. You believe in time travel, Van? Uh, no. But, you know, can't rule it out, I guess. You know, uh, no. But I know, you know what I do? Let me tell you what I do believe in real quick. I believe that as long as the math checks out as possible, and let me tell you what I mean by that. So, I watch Star Wars and I watch Star Trek and I watch all of that stuff, right? And in most of these things that you watch, the stories are uh, predicated on the fact that you know that uh, that interstellar travel is possible, right? It, Star Wars is a whole galaxy, and they go from here to here to here to here. To, let's hit the warp drive, boom! And obviously, we go, okay, that's impossible to fly at the speed of light. And so one day I'm sitting around and I'm going, who has really checked this out? And there's a Mexican physicist named Miguel Alcubierre. And he created something called the Alcubierre drive, which is a theoretical warp drive that would be able to transport humans at the speed of light. The math checks out, the math of it. The universe is just math, right? So the math checks out. It's an engineering problem. It's not whether or not it would work. It's whether or not we can build it. And that's the way I look at life. I look at life. It's not what's possible. It's whether or not you can do it. Because there are very few things that are impossible. It's not like it's... Uh, a, a theoretical problem. It's not a math problem. It's an engineering problem. So somebody ever came to me and was like, Van, you know, we could go back in the past and here's the math on it. I would be willing to hear what they would have to say. I would just say, you go first. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank Van. Let's give him a round of applause.
And that can kind of concludes. Uh, thanks to all our sponsors. Thanks to uh, Genesis U S Bank and all of our other sponsors, uh, Morgan Stanley and obviously Hot 94.5. But thanks to all of you for staying, those who stayed the whole day. Uh, we really appreciate you hanging out with us. Van, it's been great. It's good to know you. Um, appreciate the love. You know, we, we are proud of you. Continue to challenge this question, this culture as much as you can. Uh, we need more brothers who are challenging the culture versus creating the noise. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, thank you.